Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our fifth episode of the DIH Talk. And welcome after a hopefully nice summer break that you all enjoyed uh, over the past uh, weeks. And actually in Luxembourg, we are back to school. So we are also back to DIH Talk and uh, really looking forward to moderate today's uh, uh, webinar um, on artificial intelligence uh, coupled with uh, computer visioning. And we have really some interesting speakers today, I can promise already. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Joe Clemens. I'm working at uh, Lux Innovation and I'm part of the DIH team, the Digital Innovation Hub, and I will talk a little bit about that in a short moment. Just be aware that this session is uh, recorded and it will also be available for replay afterwards and you can also find it on our Lux Innovation uh, YouTube channel. Let's just share my presentation and then we go. Just a little bit on how to use the tool. It's quite simple, as you know it from most of these kind of uh, consoles. Uh, we have an area uh, for chat um, where you can place uh, general comments, whatever. We have a specific uh, section for questions and the answers. Uh, in case questions come up during the speaker's talk, please place them here. I will keep a close eye on it and we will try to answer everything during the Q&A session that is following each speaker. We have also a poll. Today we, you will find two polls uh, in that section. One is already placed. It's about your use of artificial intelligence and computer visioning. Uh, you can already start to do that now or during the course of today. And I will also mention the result of it, which will be probably interesting for all of us. And last not least, uh, you have an overview on all the people. Uh, just for everybody's knowledge, uh, today we got close to 100 registrations, which is quite nice after the summer break. And I truly hope you will enjoy uh, the session of today. Just a quick word about who we are from the Digital Innovation Hub. As you can see on this picture, um, first of all, we are supporting the manufacturing industry uh, of Luxembourg or production in general in, in digital matters. Um, and actually, we like to be the networking uh, body between all the different actors, starting from academica providers, small and large producers and many, many others that play a role in that segment. And we help also individually on certain projects uh, when you are facing financial uh, constraints or technical constraints or simply to find the right partner. In a nutshell, we always say we inform, inspire and we are in an engagement scenario. And Inform and inspire. This is typically uh, this example of the webinar, our DIH talks, always under a specific headline, as already mentioned. And what was the motivation for us uh, to go for it? Actually, it was one of the results from our digital transformation journey, where we have recognized certain, let's say, shortages in the maturity and the application of uh, artificial intelligence uh, in the market in Luxembourg in general. And this is a pity, or I, I would say it's a bit more than a pity, because actually, if we follow also international studies, there is a lot to gain for the manufacturing industry when using this kind of um, uh, technologies that are usually known and, or, or listed under industry 4.0. Uh, just as this uh, one statement uh, on equipment efficiency or cost reduction, typically in average, you can expect that you would gain, depending on the case, of course, up to 10% or even more um, 
um, when you apply this kind of technologies in it. Um, just to mention also this IDC study where we got these numbers from was a study done in the Western countries, US, Europe, and 650 companies participated. So actually it's a quite solid and reliable number. And from our study, comparing it to this IDC study, um, one of the lacks that we have already seen is simply that um, many companies are not connected enough uh, with their production floor. Um, I mean, 34% in on an international scale and 3.8, which is nearly the same number that we saw here in Luxembourg. And all this has been the motivation to select this headline also for today. And uh, then also maybe to find out where you stand as our great audience of today. Maybe you just have a look on the polls and you quickly fill out and answer these questions. I will give uh, after the first speaker the results to the audience, but you can follow it also by yourself. Now, coming to the first speaker, which will be Alexei Simet from the University of Luxembourg. Uh, he is a doctoral researcher and uh, this uh, under the chair of Dr. Um, Professor Plapper. And this is all about automation and robotization. And Alexei has something interesting to share with you today. So Alexei, I invite you to get on the platform and I will stop my presentation immediately. Alexei, please come on stage if you can. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So then let me so, share my screen so that we uh, can see my presentation. Okay, is it there? Yes, it's visible. Okay, perfect. Then, uh, yo, thank you very much for the nice introduction. As already said, my name is uh, Alexei Zimet and I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of Luxembourg. Um, what we what are going to talk about, as you can already see in the background, is the usage of CV, computer vision and artificial intelligence um, for industrial problems. Here a short overview. At first, I will give you an idea about the university and what we do. I will briefly introduce the, the terms computer vision, artificial intelligence, and convolutional neural networks. Um, and then I will directly head to the use cases where we actually applied them, um, the CNN-based CD methods. Okay, then let's have a look on the university. Uh, maybe you all, or maybe some of you have been already in contact or in touch with us. Um, basically, the university is quite young, founded in 2003. We have three faculties three interdisciplinary research centers, and we are located at three different campuses in Luxembourg. I'm sitting in Campus Kirchberg, but the main campus is in Berval, and another one is in Limpertsberg. What is maybe interesting is that we are around a thousand uh, doctoral researchers and combined with professors and other researchers. I think we are in total about 1,500 researchers working at the university in different domains. Um, I'm working in the Manufacturing Engineering Group uh, in the Department of Engineering. In our group, we are mainly working with laser assembly, robotics, value stream, and Industry 4.0. Uh, I personally am coming from the robotics and Industry 4.0 team. Um, and since all the problems I have, I try to solve, or I'm actually solving with uh, uh, artificial intelligence-based computer vision methods. I was invited to um, talk a little bit about that. Um, and so let's directly uh, dive into the topic. What is computer vision? Basically, it's the science of analyzing images or videos to extract useful information. And I think the keywords for this um, for this this talk was artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning, CNN, and computer vision. And on the right hand side, you can see how these are all connected. Basically, um, yeah. Convolutional neural networks are part of deep learning where you apply deep neural networks. And this is a subdomain of artificial intelligence. And since these networks perform very well on uh, computer vision tasks, we have a, a big overlap um, in computer vision where we actually apply those methods. Um, if, we, if you have a look on computer vision, if we dive in into the topic, um, 
with the conventional computer vision methods, we used to extract features, for example, uh, based on color. Here you can see the star base, based on gradient magnitude, which is the change in intensity values. Um, we have as an, as an edge, detect, edge detection, or we use the pattern. Um, so here we can outline this fish on the sandy background just by the pattern or the randomness of the pixel values. If we then apply some other filters and operations, we can clean the, the image and we can very good find what we're looking for. But with these conventional methods, we always need to need to define actually how and uh, we're going to find the, the information we want to have. So what uh, filters, what methods we want to use in order to get the information we want to have. And this is the opposite um, in AI-based computer vision methods. There, we actually don't care about the feature extraction anymore um, because the model will learn by itself how to extract the information we want to have. Um, and therefore, we need training data, and based on the data, the model afterwards can give the information what we have, uh, or what we want to have. Typical problems are um, on the bottom right, classification, but we just want to give a label to an image. So for example, we want to say, okay, is the cat on the image or not? And uh, a more complex task would be not only say there's a cat, but also saying where is it on pixel level? So giving a polygon a outline on the object we found. And not only for one, but for multiple objects on an image, yeah, which we call instant segmentation. There are some parts in between object detection. We just give a bounding box, but these are common tasks we do in uh, with uh, AI-based CD methods. Um, yeah, and how do how do this CNN work? These con convolutional neural networks. Therefore, we need to understand how images are represented in a computer. If you have a RGB image, that means we have three color channels, which is red, green, and blue. And all these channels are basically nothing else but matrices of um, pixel values. Yeah, so intensity values of red, of blue, and of green. And over these matrices, filters are convolving. That's where the name is coming from: convolutional network. So in the middle, you can see the filter, which is then convolving over each pixel value. And within a CNN, we are not doing it once; we are doing it multiple times because we have a network with different layers. Here you can see the layers, and each convolutional layer, um, there we apply some filters. And this is a rather simple network or just a generic um, image that you can see how it can look like. But actually on each of these convolutional layers, we, won't, uh, we don't only apply one, but we apply a multiple uh, amount of filters. And I know for a quite common network, which is called AlexNet, we have on the first layer already 96 different filters. And this is basically the principle. So we have uh, filters which convert all the images and then extract or learn um, how to extract the features we want to have. If we want to ha apply such a model, we don't need to invent these, these um, networks by ourselves. There are a lot of models already existing, so we can use them and apply them. And how do we apply them? And therefore, we are following a workflow like, workflow like this. At first, we need to have a data. And if we want to find ducks or cats or, or human, this is quite simple. We have tons of data on the internet. But if um, we are looking at industrial problems, mostly there are no data available. So we, what we need to do is then get image information, videos of the problem at hand. And sometimes it's quite easy. Sometimes it's not that easy to get the data. So what we do then is we prepare the data. We can enlarge the, the ground truth data set by certain techniques so that we have from one or two images, we get multiple images. And we need to then prepare for the model training. And uh, once we have the data set ready, we can apply it to model. As an engineer, I, of course, started with, uh, with MATLAB. But most commonly, it's Python is the um, program language you use for, for this kind of problems. And if, you're, um, you know, if the results are promising and it works on the, on the data sets, then you can go and transfer the model into your actual demonstrator or your production line um, to solve your problems. And this is exactly how we um, also address some industrial problems, which I will present now. Um, the first use case is about the assembly of textures boards, uh, which you can see here. This is just an example board, and the original boards look a little different, but the problem is the same. Uh, we want to assemble these boards with these kinds of inserts, which need to be put in to these holes. And not only one, but there are multiple insets which need to be put in the holes. And we have a huge variety in the process, actually. So uh, the dimensions change of the board, um, the position of the 
inserts or of the, the holes where these inserts need to be put in are changing um, the number of holes per volt are changing the type of inserts which come to the holes are changing then we have different appearances of the material so not only um, of the cover material but also on the whole appearance um, and last but not least since we are coming from manual assembly or manual manufacturing and then want to automate usually the environment is not made for um, you are not made for for the automation so we have a lot of disturbing lights um, and here you can see how the light may change during the course of the day we have a cloudy day then it's sunny and then um, it will be dark yeah? so this is um, the problem at hand and um, to start the process we first need to know where the bores are located on the panel in order to to automate the process this is how we started we developed a robust bore detection um, and as i said the question is how can we find these holes on different kinds of bores with uh, panels with different kind of bores um, in order to extract information for later robotic assembly and yeah first thing we need to do is we need to generate a data set um, and since here we are actually not we, we, we don't want to classify we don't want to know okay a hole is on the image or not but we want to get the exact information where the hole is located on the image so what we need to feed the model is not only the image but also the information where these holes are on the image so we see directly if we have I don't know a thousand images and you need to annotate these images this is quite a, a time-consuming task you know but there are methods how you can reduce the the time um, but this is then you need how you need to prepare the the data for the detection model we selected the YOLO v5 model maybe some of you know YOLO YOLO is a acronym for you only look once and it's um, yeah a quite common object detection model we trained it on our data set and it turned out the holes uh, were found quite well um, and not only on on this in this scenario but also on the bright scenario we didn't change the model just the input image is changing now um, with far too much lighting and also in the dark conditions now where you barely see with the eye the holes uh, the model still finds the walls and now if we um, if we go back actually we didn't train the model on this reference panel i'm just showing for for um, yeah, presentation purposes but we took the real model boards and um, yeah you can see that we trained the model on these kind of boards but it's still working on other products yeah? so the model actually learned then how to extract this circular bore information and find it on also other input images this is basically the first use case um, then as I said, after we found the holes and we inserted the inserts, um, we need to, to bond them together with glue. Here we have a um, rather simpler model, um, but the thing is we have an inlet and an outlet hole um, where we need to feed in the glue. And on the other side, the glue will spill out. Um, and you can see directly, depending on how these inserts are placed, um, this outlet is different, um, or the position of the outlet is different compared to the inlet um, hole, um, which makes it harder to just use a static sensor so there we also use the camera which is then monitoring the process from top um, and then classifying um, whether this area this outlet area whether there's enough glue or not yet enough glue so we in order how you define the problem uh, before we had a detection problem where we wanted to actually locate the holes now we just want to say if we crop this image patch of the outlet hole is on this image patch enough glue or not so this is basically a binary classification problem which makes it much more easy than the the task before um, but to start the same process we need to generate data sets therefore we build up a, a demonstrator or a test stand um, to simulate the process and generate the data um, we implement the model and basically what we do the first steps you can see here are just to extract the information of the outlet hole and then we are just focusing on the outlet hole area which is then uh, classified into full or not full and, and yeah for us it worked perfectly uh, in all cases it works correct the latency is quite good so when we stop the process it's fast enough so that nothing is overspilling um, and the same model we applied for this glue detection we then transferred to a different problem where we uh, classified the quality of holes in um, 
carbon fiber reinforced plastic boards. You know, so these models can be trained in different data and still work. In the last case study, I want to be very short. Um, there it's about the detection of unbelled edges. This is for a bench meat sheet metal um, supplier, which has the sheet metal, cuts them, bends them, and then weld them at the edges together. This is usually doing, done also manually. There are some robots, but then the path for the robot needs to be programmed in advance for every product. And what we want to have, we want to detect um, this path automatically. And how do we do it? Um, again, we get some data, we generate some data. Problem here, we only had one or two specimen and still we managed to um, yeah, train a model which can robustly detect these unwilled edges. And based on this information of now we see we have an instant segmentation, so we pick them on a pixel level, we can then calculate a class of robot to those. So that's what basically it. I think um, some nice use cases. Um, if you have more questions, you can ask them right now or later on, just can contact me and it's feel free. So now I'm open to the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alexei, indeed, uh, on the last example, there was also indeed a question from uh, Duke. It's, uh, could you do the same bore detection test by using the classical methods, whatever those classical methods could be? Um, now is the question, which uh, case study, but in general, I think many things can be done also with conventional methods. Um, for example, if you speak about the bore detection, um, therefore, for us, the problem was that the product is always changing. We have different color, different appearance, different reflectivity, which makes it hard for conventional models. But it's always depending on how you set up the scenery. Yeah, if you can, you can encapsulate the whole um, the whole um, specimen. If you have the correct lighting, you can, let's say, um, emphasize features you want to find. And for for boss, for example, if you use um, light from the dark field we call it so the light reflects not into the camera but somewhere else so only at the edges the light will be reflected into the the camera there you can probably also find the boss but then you need a different setup yeah for me it's just a camera um and i can do basically everything and it's quite simple um the setup then the model is a little more complex but yeah long story uh, long story short i think many Things can be solved with also conventional methods, but then the work you need to put in there is uh, probably higher. Um, and if it then the same has the same robustness, we don't know. Yeah, and that will, at the end of the day, define the return of investment of what you're planning to do there. Interesting. Um, another interesting question came from Mark, uh, asking uh, how large has to be the, the data sets in order to train a system? Yeah. The more, the better, usually. Um, but if I just speak about this um, example here, I think we had at the end 50 different images. Yeah. So we had, I think, um, 15 specimen, um, so different parts, which we then photographed from different angles. Um, and it turned out we had like 50 keyframes. Um, and uh, as I said before, we can use some techniques to enlarge this data set so that we will alter the images to create artificial images we then use for training. So also with a limited amount of images, you can already do quite a lot, but usually you would need, or you would, it's better to have much more um, to increase okay. the, the robustness of the model. Yeah. And for the other one, oh, sorry. Uh, for, for, for the body detection, I think we used uh, uh, 800 different images or something like that. So. Um, much more. Yeah. Okay, and the second question is, uh, did you train the model from scratch or did you already start on those examples on, um, yeah, uh, on material you had or on a pre-trained model already, something like that? Both. So what we did, we, we always used existing models. So um, as I said, this YOLO V5, is one model, a detection model. And here we use Detectron 2, which is uh, another model, which can also predict on instance or on, on pixel level. You can do this math, you can do it, which can do even much more. Um, so the, the, the framework is always existing. 
And then for the networks which are in these frameworks, we use usually pre-trained networks. So we don't uh, in, in, initialize them randomly. So if you go back to the CNNs, they can be just, let's say, new or pre-trained uh, on large data sets. And this is usually what we apply because we achieve better results. Okay, interesting. A question for myself, uh, uh, Alexei. Yesterday we had been with a, with a production company here in Luxembourg um, and they do a bit of it already, but still there is human inspection on the quality control side because they said there are certain limit, uh, limits, technical limits uh, when you do the particularly on the part of the computer visioning. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the, the limits that you are experiencing, experiencing from a research side? Um, yeah, uh, for me, I have some, for example, sometimes the limit um, that the bounding box is not as accurate as I want them to be. Um, if I want to process this information further regarding um, the first detection, so finding the object on the image, um, or finding a defect, for example, I so far, uh, did, in my cases, didn't experience any limits by the model um, itself. So only then how I can use the information or is the information I get enough to, for example, automate a process. But um, to, to, for the quality inspection, I think to just say, okay, it's good or it's not good enough, um, it should work. But, uh, a big but, it always depends on how good the model needs to be. Yeah? So um, if, if we, we have a zero uh, error tolerance, then maybe um, it won't work. But if we um, if 98% are OK, um, then, then maybe it, it's good enough. Yeah? Interesting. Thanks for that. There are no, no further questions yet in the question section, but please go ahead, uh, audience, uh, to place ones. And maybe you, Alexei, you can uh, con keep an eye on it and maybe uh, answer um, uh, during the webinar via the chat function, uh, via yes. the question function. Uh, that yes. would be appreciated. I'll send the chat. And also, if you have questions later on, not today, but tomorrow, you think about them. You can still contact me just uh, by email or LinkedIn or whatever. So then, thank you very much for, for thank listening. Thank you, Alexei. It was very uh, interesting. Uh, good introduction and good luck for your research. Thank you. Thank you. And let's go ahead with our okay. agenda. So it's a poll. Um, I did not look in the last uh, few but just to give some tendencies from the audience, we had about uh, 22, 24 answers. Uh, 45 has, has neither artificial intelligence or computer visioning in place. Actually, 23, 25% are already using it in the combination and the rest is uh, halfway uh, either on artificial intelligence or testing or using already computer visioning, which is quite interesting. Um, and that guides me over to Virginie, uh, because um, for those who might be in linked in using or connected already with Virginie, they are already aware that she is sharing actually quite a lot of uh, uh, information about artificial in gen uh, intelligence in general. And there are a lot of use cases placed there. And I'm really looking forward to see more today. The company Teamwork is present uh, here in Luxembourg, of course. Uh, Virginie is joining us from France today. Thank you, Vir Virginie, and welcome on board. The stage is your. Thank you. Just I will share my presentation. Okay, I think it's working. You can see it. I'm sorry, I've got my cat uh, with me. <laughs> and my cat decided to come exactly when I was started speaking. <laughs> so maybe you will see a cat somewhere in the image. Uh, so yes, I will speak about three use cases we have in teamwork. We have done in teamwork in the last years, 
with artificial intelligence and vision. And so I will not be able to give you a lot of details about these use cases because we are uh, under NDA with our customers. So I cannot give you the name or the exact product they are making, but uh, I will try to make it a bit uh, general so you can understand what we are trying to achieve with uh, these uh, customers. Um, as uh, Joachim has said, I work for Teamwork in France. I am the manager of the modern data department. So we have teams around data science, data engineering, and data integration for the whole company. So we have nearly 20 offices in different uh, countries. We have one in Luxembourg, and I am in the one in Lyon in France. Uh, I've got a PhD in artificial intelligence when it was not cool to do artificial intelligence so many years ago uh, and I've got some awards uh, on the subject. And so for the first uh, use case, uh, it is a company that manufactures semiconductors. It is not a real image. Every image I will show you are made by an AI uh, which is named DALI. DALI is created by OpenAI and so you just have to type some text and it will create for you an image. And so you can see that this is not a real image. So the image is a bit strange, uh, but I cannot show you the real images of the customer, uh, as I have said. So uh, this company is uh, doing semiconductors and they want to do quality control, of course, on the products they are making. Um, and uh, it was very difficult for humans to do that. So they have chosen to create a classical computer vision program to detect if there are some defects on the products or things like that. Um, and it, what, it was working quite good, except that uh, they needed to do a calibration of the camera every time something was moving in the machine. So every time they are doing some maintenance, they have to calibrate again the program and it was very difficult and long to do. Uh, moreover, sometimes there are some interventions uh, on the machines on the weekends and uh, no one was here to calibrate, oh, I'm sorry for my cat, <laughs> to calibrate the machine um, during, uh, the, during the weekend. And so they have to wait until Monday to use the program again. And so they have to switch back to uh, manual inspection mode uh, during the whole weekend. And it was something very difficult for them. So they wanted to try AI uh, to have something that was working even if the camera was moving a bit and that the product was not exactly at the same place or the light was changing because there was more light or less light because you have to change sometimes the lights in the machine. And if you change it, you will go from a uh, small light to a uh, big light, for example, or things like that. Uh, so they wanted something with more adaptation and it's what we have done. Uh, so like Alexei, as, uh, as said before, it is exactly the same steps. The first one is to get images. Uh, in this case, we had luck because they had some cameras in the machines. So we had a lot of images to work with, but most of the time on the images, there were no, no defects because of course they are not making a lot of defects. So what was difficult was not to have images, but to have images with defects. And we have labeled uh, these images to exactly say where the defects were uh, on the image and on the products. Um, then uh, we processed the images because, of course, AI can adapt to many cases, but it is a good thing to pre-process the images to have something more easy for the model. And so we have changed the brightness of the images, for example. So it's always the same when we put them in the model. And this is classical vision. So we use classical computer vision and AI in this project. Uh, the third step is to create the model. We have used deep learning with CNN, exactly as uh, Alexei has said. We have used a ResNet, a, re a pre-trained ResNet. Uh, and we used something like 2,000 images to train the model. And so the model was then tested 
and images that were not used for the training part. And we obtained these images during uh, the project. It was the new images uh, during the time we processed the images and so on. So we have really new images to test uh, that. And it was very good. Uh, but something important is that with this program, we find twice the number of defects that they found before, uh, because uh, in fact, there were defects that they were not able to spot. And now with AI, we can spot them. So the number of defects has grown uh, just because AI was better than what they were doing before. Uh, the, Final step is uh, industrialization. Uh, making a model is very good, but for a company, it is not sufficient because you have to use it in your IT. So you have to uh, secure it, to monitor it, and to connect it to the real IT, to the machines, to uh, maybe uh, NIRP or thing like that, SAP, or I don't know uh, which tool you are using in uh, your company. And so we connect it to everything and we have done some, uh, some monitoring and security around it to use it and know the model is used uh, in the factory. So it was a great project. It was something like uh, four months. We have worked two times, two months on this project because we had a first step and we needed more images. So we have made a pause. Uh, and then we have started again with more images and the project was better. And we have done two months the first time and two months the second time uh, on this project. Of course, there can be some very difficult uh, situations. For example, we have worked for a company who is manufacturing drugs and food complements, and you have no possibilities to make an error for them because if you are selling the wrong, the wrong drug uh, in a bag because you have a bag of, I don't know, the A drug and there is one B drug inside it, you can kill someone. So it is a very, very big problem. Um, and we have to take into account the medical environment and so on. So sometimes you have many problems if you have some errors and sometimes they are not so important. And so you have to choose the right level for your models, uh, depending on what is the risk of an error on your case. Uh, moreover, in this case, we have to uh, see the, uh, the, the complements and so on from every angle. And so you cannot do that just by posing the products and just taking one image uh, of it. So you have to take multiple images and to be sure that you have seen every uh, part of the product. And it is very difficult. You cannot do that with just AI. You have to, to use uh, mechanics and robotics to do that. So uh, they had to create a wall machine specifically for this use case to take the products, to turn the products, to take every images that you need and to create then the model to do that. So it was a big project. Uh, the project is still uh, in the making. Uh, it's not finished. We have helped them a lot at the beginning to understand what was the constraints and the requirements for this kind of project for the AI part, because they are not specialists of AI, of course. And so you have to think about it when you don't know AI or you don't know a lot about AI and you have a big project, maybe you will have to take someone just to help you to understand what are the requirements of the project, what are the constraints, what you can do, what you cannot do, and then go to other people to do the project, but to be a companion to do that and don't go alone. It's dangerous to go alone, as we said in Zelda. I think it's, here it is nearly the same. So uh, if you need some help, take some help with you. It may be help you to create the good project for your use case. And the last use case I will speak about is about uh, uh, luxury watch uh, making. So it was 
uh, watches that are under warranty uh, during your whole uh, life. And so it's a bit different. This time we are not working on the making of the products. We are working on uh, after sales. So you can use image uh, and AI on the creation process on the, in the factory, but you can use it in other parts of your business. And here in after sales, uh, we had to recognize the model of the watch from its photo because they are luxury watch and jewelers don't always know how to recognize every model of every brand that they are selling. And so it was a semi-automatic determination. We give the jeweler the, jeweler the, the most uh, probable models and he just has to choose between three models and not in the whole catalog of uh, models. And then he can create a quote to know where to send the watch and what's the value of the watch. So he is able to do some more precise work with the customers. And, uh, and it was very important for the luxury watch industry to do this kind of things. Uh, I cannot say the name of the brand, of course, like for every subject I have uh, show you. Um, and so AI and vision are not used only in the creation in the process of making things and so on you can use it on other places and we have uh, spoken about images of products but you can use it on images of text for example and we have done some use cases on pdf for example to extract information uh, in pdf or to detect uh, which kind of pdf you have received and so on it's also ai with vision but it's not in the same type of use cases. So you can do a lot of things. In fact, with vision and use cases, it is not only defect detection or placement detection or things like that. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I'm finished with my presentation. <laughs> I don't know if there are some questions. Oh, it's not the last one. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That was me now. I was too fast. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> Virginie, thank you very much. Uh, that was really quite interesting. I really find it uh, very motivational also your point that, of course, when you think about uh, computer visioning in combination with artificial intelligence and what we see, in fact, a lot is on quality control. Yeah. But I really did like your two last examples that it can be used for many, many other things as well. Um, and now we have also questions coming in. Uh, the first one is coming from Mark. Um, did you ever run into issues with model performance degrading over time in the industrial environment? Uh, yes, it's something that is uh, that we see a lot of time because everything is changing. The world is changing. The camera are changing. The images are with maybe they are more dust. Uh, on the lenses and so you see less the images and so on or the light is different or, and so on. So to not have that, uh, we have something that we do uh, in nearly every case. We are just training again the model every, I don't know, maybe every month, every six months. It depends on the model. And so we are taking some new images from the production line and we are training it again and we put it again and we can do that in a fully automated mode. And so the model is just retraining itself and someone has just to say, okay, I go live with this new model. Of course, we, have te we are testing these new models on uh, images that we know uh, and we are uh, looking if the metrics are still the same or better than the previous model. If the metrics are not better, we are not putting in production the new model, but we are doing things like that to keep a good rate because we will always have degradation, not because the model is changing, because the model is not changing, but because the world is changing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Quite interesting. So maintenance is surely required also once you have such a solution in place. Yeah. And this, 
I think that goes also a bit in the best practice uh, direction, this question from Mark, um, basically asking, once you have such a model or solution in place, is it still necessary to safeguard uh, the control with humans? It depends on the use cases, but most of the time we still keep humans in the loop. Uh, for example, in the first, um, the first example I have given around the semiconductors industry, in fact, uh, before the program, humans were looking at every product they were making in the factory. And now they are just looking at the products that we have flagged with defects. And so the no defect products are just uh, going on in the production line, but the ones with defect are all seen by a human to validate it and to choose what to do with the product because they are not very cheap and so you have to maybe recycle the product or just throw it away and so there is a human that is doing that only on the products that we are not sure they are correct but we are if we are sure the products are correct they are going on uh, in the production line so yes in some cases we keep a human in the loop to do the, the process. It is not a fully automated with no humans uh, to do that. I mean, from a, let's say, best practice, what we see is also when once you implement that, it's usually you have a specialized partner uh, in the loop, but the knowledge is actually with the people. So it's anyway a solution you build together at the end of the day. That's uh, what I would add to this. But thank you, um, Virginie. And here is a question from Jörg. He is actually asking, uh, can it also be used to simply measure dimensions of a product? Um, yes, we have done some projects, for example, in the drug uh, and food complements company. Uh, there were some too small or too big uh, products, but we are not using AI for that because AI and CNN are not very good at uh, giving the size of an object. So we have uh, some classical computer vision in the process and we have both of them. We use classical computer vision and AI. So AI is detecting some defects and we use classical computer vision to detect the colors and the sizes because sizes and colors are very difficult to do with just AI and you have better results with computer vision and classical computer vision. So we have both of them depending on what you are trying to achieve in your production line. And maybe you will use both of them or a lot of models. Each one is doing one uh, test in your production line. Okay, thank you. And with the next question, we are actually going in the, into the opposite direction. Uh, asking uh, can it be applied also on 3d data 3d meshes uh, 3d point clouds uh, i have not shown 3d use cases we have worked with 3d in one use case it was for shoes and we have to work with the 3d of the shoe and yes we can do some things but it will not be with cnn exactly because cnn are really for 2d images and we have to create some custom algorithm for 3d because there are not a lot of them working on 3d so it is very difficult to work on 3d right now because there's not a lot of tools to do that but it's possible to work on 3d also okay and one precision, and now I will read out the question from Jörg because maybe my interpretation was not good enough. Uh, he was, uh, my question was about measuring, uh, about measuring with opti optical means. Um, so I guess it's about optical combined with AI, I would assume, but I'm not 100% sure now. Yeah, I think so. It is what I have said, maybe because we used classical computer vision to detect size of products and things like that. You can use other uh, means to do that, maybe a leader or thing like that to detect the size, because AI is not very good at detecting the right size and if it is the right size or if it is too big or too small. So, yeah, you will have to use something else uh, for the sizes. 
Okay, thank you. One question from my side, Virginie, is basically, I mean, you are so long in that business and in that research, let's say, what would you say has changed over the past years that made it so attractive um, that it can be applied or even be, can it be applied on a SME level or is it just a technology for the big players? No, I think that uh, I've got my cat again. <laughs> I like Every, your cat. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Everyone can use AI right now, but at the beginning when I started in AI, I was working on neural networks uh, before deep learning even exists. And so it was very difficult to do at that time because we have to code everything from scratch. There were nothing, no frameworks, uh, no languages, no images, no pre-trained models, no architectures that were known like we have right now. And the computers were not very powerful. And now we can use some cloud computing. And it is very easy with cloud compute to just say, OK, I want two hours of a very big machine to do my training. And I'm not doing it on my personal computer. I don't have to buy a computer to do the training. And so everything of that have made it very easy right now to do. Uh, when I started, it was very difficult to do some neural networks with four layers. And now we have something like 200 layers. So. And 200 layers right now is not that difficult to do, but it was very difficult with four layers at that time. It was nearly 20 years ago. Uh, it was 19 years ago, in fact. <laughs> and so in 19 years, a lot of, of, of things have, uh, have changed. And so with the, the compute power, with the tools and frameworks that we can use to create everything and with the pretend models we have something very very easy right now not in every cases there are some cases that are more difficult to do of course but in a lot of cases we can do some things very quickly and as i have said for the first use case it was two times um, two months so it was four months uh, in total so it's uh, not a very big uh, project and you can do that very quickly and we have made four months because we had some problems about uh, the images and we have to take some uh, more images to do a better model uh, so without these kind of things i think in two or three months we can do a project uh, to create defect detection so it's not that big right now. At that time, you had to do everything, and uh, it was very, very difficult. Very interesting answer, I have to say, particularly um, making the difference between training a model and using the model later on. And uh, just to mention to the audience, uh, particularly when you run into computing issues, also we from DIH can help uh, by use of our Meluxina HPC that we have here in Luxembourg. Uh, Virginie, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, and um, thanks a lot for sharing that information and the insights you had, you have. Uh, so thanks to France uh, already by now. Thank you. Thank you and for the invitation. You're more than welcome. And we will now move to our next element, which is our sneak review, as we call it, uh, just to explain it for those that don't know the concept. Uh, actually, here we like to give uh, newcomers, startup companies, uh, a chance to get known to the Luxembourgish uh, uh, manufacturing sector. And I'm really, really happy today to introduce Johannes, Johannes Kneer, who founded the company Newflow here in Luxembourg. And um, yeah, all the rest, all the other explanation and introduction will come from Johannes in a second. <laughs> Thank you, Joachim, for your kind introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Share my screen. <clears throat> Oh, there we go. So my company, Newflow, um, provides engineering support and engineered solutions based on physical understanding. And coming from a total machinery background, the core know-how that we provide is in fluid mechanics, heat transfer, 
measurement technology, data acquisition, and um, mod modeling and programming of physics, really. And we have a really broad portfolio of different um, methods for problem solving, starting in the very deep numerical um, methods with 1D um, equation solving based on data correlation, existing correlations going to fully 3D simulations of fluid mechanics and heat transfer problems, but then also connecting those to the reality with um, data acquisition and custom um, experimental setups to actually gain the data that you need to train your models. Now, typically we provide the engineering support more in the direction of R&D departments and engineered solutions more into the operations part of companies. But now to add to today, today's topic of computer vision, I want to spend the rest of the time that I have here on um, infrared thermography. And before we really delve into that topic, I want just to remind us a little bit of what actually infrared is, so we have a good understanding of the examples that I'll show later. So here you see the spectrum of light from X-ray over UV over the visible, visible range of light that we can actually see with our eyes to the infrared that we cannot see. But if there's enough infrared, like think of a fire, you can feel the warmth. And then there's a microwave and radio that's not interesting today. So we cannot see the infrared um, light, but we can build sensors that detect the heat radiation coming off of um, objects. And here on the right, you see a typical image um, as probably a manufacturer of such cameras would present to you in pseudo colors. Um, and this is probably what you've all been all seen already. Pseudo colors, because what we get is an intensity map, so in gray, but much more visu visually appealing are those um, colored images. To delve into the um, applications, I try to categorize them into three sections. And I'll just go over them and give you an idea of what maybe you can do in your uh, production with by using infrared thermography or infrared vision. First, there's night vision. So if you think of surveillance cameras, these act, are active systems where you shine infrared light onto the objects and onto the scene that you want to observe. And you have an infrared sensitive camera that then gives you a brightly lit image, even though we as humans can't see anything because it's dark, at least in the visual spectrum. And then what you've also probably seen on the news is the use of um, infrared system of passive systems that's, that pick up the heat radiation uh, of the environment and of humans uh, for search and rescue. So if you humans are relatively hot, like 37 degrees Celsius, if the environment is cold enough, you can really nicely pick out um, humans on the ground and find them easily from a helicopter, for example. Um, then in the infrared, as you move along the light spectrum, properties of material may change. And this is a really nice example of two pictures, one in the visual range and one in the infrared range. And you can see that this guy's classes are transparent in the visual, obviously, in, in the visual range, they are uh, transparent. But in infrared, they are not transparent. So you can actually see the temperature of the glasses and not the temperature of the skin behind the glasses. And then more interesting for applications in manufacturing is that some things are actually transparent in infrared that are not in, in the visual range. Like this thin foil, you can't look through the black foil in here, but you can see right through it. And infrared and just think of maybe a product that's already packaged and with infrared you can sometimes just look right through the package uh, the packaging and then for me at least that's the most interesting application there's infrared thermography so far i've talked about um, infrared images and heat radiation but it's really just images they give you maybe a hint of temperature, but they are not calibrated to temperature. If you calibrate the temperature, what you get is an image 
and every single pixel is basically a temperature sensor. Um, so what you're now looking at is uh, a temperature image. And this is interesting to monitor processes where temperature is important. And I just picked a very simple example here of 3D printing, because here for quality prints, temperature management is really important. The bed temperature needs to be right, the nozzle temperature needs to be right, the right amount of cooling needs to be provided, and so on and so forth. So what we're looking here at is a visual image with high resolution, really crisp, that we can apply all our, our computer vision algorithms to, also um, artificial intelligence, no matter what, you can just use them on the visual image. And then we have a fused infrared image that we can take the data out. So in this example, I'm tracking the moving nozzle of the printer, but then taking the data out of the infrared uh, thermography image and plotting that temperature data as a graph next to the, to the movie. And what you see is that the printer heats up, it stays at a constant temperature for a while, and then when it starts printing, the printhead uh, temperature is fluctuating. So due to the time constraints that I have today, this is all I could show you. But what, I, what did I show you? I showed you some examples of what you can maybe do with infrared cameras and thermography in your manufacturing on, on your shop floor. I showed you that you can actually measure temperature um, through optical means. So there's no need for direct instrumentation on the objects that you want to measure. And I showed you that you can use computer vision to um, have a data reduction and not because the full image is a lot of data. Just picking out what you're interested in reduces the data and makes it much more manageable. So if this topic or any of the other topics I just glanced over in the very beginning of my presentation is interesting to you, please feel free to contact me. Just give me a phone call, write me an email, ask Joachim to um, um, set up a meeting or ask me directly. So thank you very much for your time and for listening to me. Thank you, Johannes. And uh, you you brought up a good point. Uh, often we get asked, are we sharing uh, the contact data with those who are speaking up? Uh, we don't because of GDPR limitations. Uh, we cannot do that. Uh, but as you have seen already, uh, Johannes also virtually placed their contact details into the chat, um, but you will find them anyway via social media channels. But if necessary, of course, come back uh, to us from the DIH. That's actually part of our job to connect you to the right partners, to the right uh, academica here in Luxembourg, um, which is part of our job. So Johannes, thank you, but also thank you to, uh, thanks to Virginie and Alexei for the interesting content you have provided today. Uh, it was really cool. I learned a lot also. Uh, good questions from the audience, I have to say. So very much appreciated. Um, and it was the first time that we had a cat in our <laughs> session, which is also quite nice. Um, and. Of course, we all do that for you, for the audience. Um, so please give us also uh, feedback. Uh, and this is the second poll you already find. Uh, if, if we consider our mission of inform and inspire, did it fulfill your expectations? And if you have ideas how to improve or certain topics you like to be covered as part of our DIH talk or any other events that we are organizing here at Lux Innovation, simply contact us, uh, not a problem, but please fill out the feedbacks that gives us already an indication uh, if today's session was uh, going in the right direction and so on. So thanks, thanks for your feedback. Um, just like to uh, mention that uh, on October we have already the next one. Again, it goes a little bit in the direction of artificial intelligence, but first of all, you need the data. So this session will be a lot about IoT, how to gather the data from somewhere, usually production floor in our case, because we focus on manufacturing. Um, 
And I like to point out our DIH tour. In case you are not aware of, uh, we are going around Luxembourg uh, next week with the yellow bus. We are visiting uh, in three weeks nine different zone industriels uh, with our bus. And here you see the tour that you also find, of course, on our web pages. And we have quite an interesting program again aligned with the feedback we have received from individual discussions, but also the survey, we focus pretty much on artificial intelligence, machine learning. It's actually done in partnership with CP Solutions, Data Things, and Visata. Will be quite interesting. We from Lux Innovation will give an overview in the bus on the different uh, financial aid programs that can be national ones, can be European ones. And each day at uh, three o'clock, we have a round table uh, discussion in the bus that is kicked off with the keynote and the hosting company of that day is also offering um, uh, a factory tour afterwards, which find a lot of interest. Again, it's also a chance to do networking because it's at the end, we will group together again in the bus to answer questions, to get in contact and uh, exchange ideas, challenges, uh, and experience. Um, so here again, where you find all our events and thanks a lot for your participation today. Thanks a lot to the speakers and see you soon again. Thank you very much. Bye for now.